let's have one final uh, panel discussion before we break and talk about the North. We've got a mic open there. We've got people lining up. Nicole. Hi. Um, my question was about the adult mm -hmm. obesity clinic. What are the reimbursement barriers? I know the, the pediatric clinic kind of touched upon there really are no funding sources. I could imagine the same being true for the adult clinic as well. Okay. So finances is always a big problem, of course. So what we're thinking is that part of our clinic will be covered by insurance because patients will have comorbidities and we can bill insurance for those comorbidities. But um, we also think that patients might have to pay an initial fee. And if you look at the um, Bay Area weight loss programs, all of them have a fee. So I don't think that patients will be opposed to that. I should clarify, too, that in the pediatric uh, clinic. Our pediatric weight clinic does go through standard reimbursement, gets standard reimbursement from Medi-Cal and, uh, and private insurers for, for the clinic setting. It's just our group program does not get reimbursed. It's not considered a, uh, there's, there's no, uh, the insurance companies will not, uh, will not pay for that. And a lot of the employee assistant programs or the employee employer programs will not consider treatment that is primarily for the child to be something that they will include under your, under those, uh, mm -hmm. under those programs. That, if you pay full amount, it's thirty-five hundred dollars, which actually sounds like a lot, but it's twenty-five weekly sessions of an hour and a half for both the kids and the parents. So it's compared to other medical programs, but uh, we have had no luck. We've worked, we've been working for fifteen years to get insurance companies to pay for it. Uh, it's staffed by uh, mainly people with a health education background, counseling background, uh, but not too much. We actually like to have parents uh, lead groups, people because uh, who don't have necessarily a, a lot of counseling training because it's following a very uh, a very set protocol, behavioral protocol. Dr. King. Thanks for three excellent. Um, presentations, very interesting. I have two questions. The first one is for all three panelists, and it has to do with potential synergies between Tom's program, which is well established. Tom is a, a behavioral scientist in his heart, if not his training, uh, you know, his MD training. And I would love to see the synergies in terms of the adult, the new adult vision for weight, so I'm, I'm wondering if you all can talk a little bit about that in terms of Tom's outreach and his vision and how some of that can be perhaps piggybacked into the adult thing. Um, the second question has to do with Maya's slide where she showed the exercise specialist in parentheses. And so <laughs> what we're hearing, of course, is the one half of the energy balance story, which is pretty much what we hear worldwide these days, and it would be lovely to hear about both parts of the energy balance story. And I was actually looking for that in Tom's slides, because I know Tom is a firm believer in the exercise part of the equation. And I didn't see it in your slides either, Tom, in terms of having expertise bring these exercise specialists to the table or else work out referral patterns because we have a plethora of incredibly well-trained exercise specialists in the community that could deal very effectively with your patients across the lifespan. So I'd love to hear some discussion on, on both of those issues. Well, I can start on the first one because as Tom was speaking, Maya and I were whispering and saying, gosh, what a model program you've established for the pediatric population. And I guess it's been one of the jewels, if you will, of, of uh, uh, LPCH to have a, an outreach program plus a, a, a home base for managing pediatric obesity or weight, weight issues in, in adolescents. We would love to be part of a group effort to establish the same kind of uh, 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 presence on the adult side. And I think Stanford Hospital and Clinics doesn't really have any kind of dedicated effort this way. There is a bariatric clinic, but if you have someone that um, is an adult with obesity and you want a medical approach, there really isn't a center for that. And there are community efforts ongoing both in Santa Clara and um, uh, San Mateo counties in the public health departments, but we aren't firmly linked in as from a center point of view the way you would be 
And I think it's a, it's a great opportunity, and I, I invite uh, us to all take up this challenge to try to build that center. We're very keen on it, but obviously mm -hmm. requires some help uh, from programmatic uh, planning and also from support from others. I don't know, Maya, if you want to comment. Yeah, I completely agree with that. It would also be interested to see if you teach the parents to lose weight and at the same time the kids in the pediatric center, if you have better outcomes, because then you have a whole family participating in the weight loss effort. And I should mention, because Mark Cullen said, the Div Division of General Internal Medicine within the Department of Medicine is very eager to get something going with the hospital in this area. And most of, most of the uh, adult obesity work has been, a, in my observation, driven by the surgical programs in some ways, too. And so we have talked to John for quite a while about having combined clinics and, and hopefully even shared space and, and stuff. And that was, that was part of the plan. At one point, um, I think things have changed in terms of space and other things, but it's uh, because because all of his many of his patients and a lot of their patients have have children too, and obesity and overweight tends to run in families, and so it, it makes a lot of sense to work together and uh, and share resources, which is something that we've been um, we've been trying to do for a while. It just hasn't really happened, and some of it is sort of structural barriers that exist. Um, between the way adult patients and pediatric patients are dealt with here and stuff, but I think it's possible. In terms of physical activity, we do, as you know, part of the, uh, part of the traffic light program, even that program is, is we do point systems and physical activity is, uh, is, is rewarded just as much as changes in diet for that too, but very behavioral. And, and in, in the pediatric um, setting, uh, we don't do as much. We don't send kids. We do exercise with them in some of the sessions, but you don't send them to a gym necessarily, or to you send them to try and get them hooked up with an after-school program or programs at a YMCA or, or things like that. We do a lot of work to try and and help them with that. Um, walking and and running or just exercising for exercise's sake has has never been very successful, at least in in our patients. Yeah, we are certainly not going to neglect the exercise and the fitness component. Um, so we will have the goal of 175 minutes per week and 10,000 steps. But it would be nice to have a dedicated exercise physiologist. But of course, it's a funding issue. But there are, there are tons of specialists. Plus, I don't know if Wes Alice is here. You know, we have people on campus, the health improvement program. Mm -hmm. If you continue that, go to the mic because they're videotaping it and they can't hear on the videotape if you don't talk into the mic. Thanks, Abby. <laughs> Anyone else? Dr. Veronica Yank. Thank you all. Um, in light of I know a lot of the barriers being funding, um, in particular not just with the exercise physiologist, but with the group visits, and yet the data showing that these do help. Um, and in light of the emerging CMS potential approval for, at least on the adult side, having intensive behavioral therapy for obesity reimbursed for physicians or um, the equivalent providers, are any of you aware at a national level about movement towards reimbursement, whether for group visits or others? Because I, you know, the, over the past week, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid has released its proposal to reimburse um, for intensive behavioral therapy sessions with an MD or equivalent provider, which certainly I'm happy about. But I know that I may not be the best person to deliver these um, intensive behavioral interventions. And so I think it's a major oversight on the part of CMS to not explore some other options. So for those of you who are more connected than I am, I wonder at a higher policy level whether this is being discussed. Do you have any ear to the ground uh, comments about that? 
So I'm not sure if the group therapies are included in that. And if They're you look not. at the wording, it's within a primary care setting. Exactly. So it needs to be within a primary care setting. Since we are in the Department of Internal Medicine, I hope that we can take advantage of this. But the group therapy still, I think, need to be funded just like in pediatrics out of individual. So that's, I guess I was wondering, Tom, if you've been involved in any more national policy debates? Because, well, again, while I'm thrilled that this has come out, I am very disappointed that it's, again, going to be me being be reimbursed for doing intensive behavioral therapy with my patient in my one-on-one -on -one sessions in the exam room. And while I, I do think that I'm fairly good at it, I think that the evidence shows that there are probably people who are much better than I am. Yeah, there are, there are group visit codes that can be used, but, it's, uh, um, but they're for licensed. I think they're pretty, the consultants tell us we can only use it for licensed providers who are generally, as you suggest, may not be the best trained, and they're also the most expensive. Yeah. And so uh, it's, yeah, I don't know where, where work is going on in terms of groups going. There is, I mean, the, the big thing last year was when, was it last year, the year before, when Medi Medicare actually took obesity off the list of exclusions of things that they'd pay for, right? It was a, yeah. I mean, it took about a decade to get, to get obesity removed from the list of things that you couldn't, that were not covered, I guess. But um, the, uh, yeah, we, there's just a lot of resistance. And the, you know, I mean, you know this, there's a, there's a real double standard yeah. with things in that they say that, yeah, well, you know, if, if your patient has diabetes, then all of a sudden everything's covered. But until they get diabetes, we, you know, you have to fend on your own. But just a quick comment from the Society of Behavioral Medicine standpoint. So there has been a comment period specific to what Veronica was just saying. And there are organizations that are giving feedback to CMS that just limiting it to the doc is not going to probably be the best mm -hmm. roadmap for trying to have effects, that it needs to be broadened. So hopefully, there, people are getting feedback on the policy level. Whether they're going to do anything about it, I don't know. But people have caught the same issue mm -hmm. and are trying to provide that input. I'm going to look over to Mark or Randy. Do you know anything? No, I think, I think you summarized where it is. Um, the question is, you know, where are the consultants? I think we need, to, we need to start with friends. And this is probably the best way to do it. Yeah, I've written a lot of proposals to foundations saying that in the next five years, we expect there to be reimbursement, and so this will be sustaining. And, <laughs> and it seems like I keep doing that, and the, the frame keeps moving. And, I had a question about the pediatric weight control program. I was wondering if you could talk a little more about how you address maintenance and what is your message to parents about uh, what's a healthy way to, for obese kids to gain weight over time as they grow? Okay, for, um, well in terms of uh, uh, sustaining the changes and stuff, we do about half of the 25 weeks is spent on, on focusing on maintenance issues. And a lot of it is focused on problem solving and what to do if you uh, have, if you have problems, if you, if, uh, if you all of a sudden sort of fall off of your, your goals, you know, what do you do? How do you start again? How do you deal with people trying to sabotage your progress uh, like other family members? Um, what do you do with holidays? How do you deal with things going on at schools and parties, things like that? And so a lot of it is, is problem solving that occurs through the, that treatment to try and promote maintenance. We actually don't know what happens after six months yet because we don't have the resources to follow the patients beyond there either. And so just providing six months is it's actually not that short for a lot of weight loss trials and kids. Um, and uh, the other part was a healthy weight for kids, is that we would like, the ultimate goal is to get them back below the 95th percentile. You know, we would like to get them there, which is what the definition of obesity in kids for, and that, that lines up with about a BMI of 30 in adulthood, uh, if you follow the curves through. And uh, we, with our, with our weight loss during the program, if they're losing more than, uh, if they're losing more than a, a pound a week, or more than two pounds a week, uh, we actually look at them very closely to make sure that they're not, uh, that they're not doing something that's unhealthful. 
to try and control their weight. So they're not starving themselves. They're not, they haven't started doing um, purging or anything like that. So. And I wanted to thank Chris Gardner because uh, the, the purpose of today was to uh, provide some uh, interinstitutional uh, exchanges. And as an example, I think Michaela Kiernan's thought about maintenance early and teaching tools of maintenance, either it's something we're thinking about based on your discussion, or it might be something that even if we use later, a lot of the psychological tools that you've introduced to the group and that your research has shown to be effective may be things we would adopt in our program. So thank you and thank Chris for encouraging this exchange. All right. Yeah, I got a quick one for Abby and Tom. And Tom, you probably know more about this than I do, just in terms of the reimbursement issue. Uh, I just joined TOS fairly recently, the Obesity Society, TOS, and I, wasn't there a debate recently that as a group, as a, a society, they decided to classify obesity as a disease, not a condition? Is that just a shallow gesture, as, uh, since we have the president of SBM here? As a professional society, if you ruled obesity as a disease, not a condition, is, are those the kinds of steps that that could move this forward in, in terms of being reimbursable and, and being assigned a code? Didn't TOS officially do that? Does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, it's always been a big, well, TOS has always been dominated by the, from the, by the clinical side and by, by clinicians and stuff too. So it's, I think it's moving towards that. I think that's the strategy that occurred with alcohol and alcoholism and things. If you can, if you can get things defined uh, more traditionally as diseases, then they're more likely to be reimbursed. But I don't know. It hasn't seemed to have much of an, you know, of an impact. I think even despite the, the insurance companies that we've talked to, I've talked to a lot of medical directors of insurance companies over the years, and I, I get the feeling that they're just, with this epidemic, because mm. you know, it's more than two-thirds of adults are overweight in this country, and it's growing around the world, and almost 20% of kids are classified as obese. The, uh, they're worried about opening the floodgates, that and they sense. think that they're, they're just going to get killed. Yeah, and I would just add to that, it, it medicalizes a sociological, sociocultural public health problem. So I understand in the short term with the reimbursement how that makes sense. I'm not sure, given that the determinants go so far beyond medical issues. I mean, they're cultural, environmental, big picture public health issues. I don't think I would be in favor of, of making something a disease so that it could simply be reimbursed. And I'm not sure the people who are overweight, I'm not sure how people would feel about that. It's an interesting thing when your population, 80% of your population is diseased. I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think it's a big, it's an interesting question, but um, I think we'd have to think beyond the reimbursement issues. Well, that's why they elect wise leaders like you to be the president of SBM. Thanks. Other thoughts? We're, somehow we're actually almost right on time. We're about 10 minutes further than we said we would be at the beginning of the day. Can we thank our panel group for this afternoon? The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.